Chicago's very own 9 o'clock news. A West Side High School is the latest scene of a violent shooting. This time, a 16-year-old boy is the victim, taking a bullet in the head just steps from the main school doors. Good evening, I'm Allison Payne. And I'm Steve Sanders, sitting in for Rick Rosenthal. Police call the incident a drive-by shooting and still do not know if the student was the intended target. They're hoping to get answers from the boy who tonight lies seriously hurt at Mount Sinai Hospital. That is where Jim Ramsey is standing by with this live update. Jim? Steve, it's our understanding that the patient had a CAT scan this afternoon, and the result of that indicated no brain damage and no cranial damage. He has been identified as Leroy Crowley, 16 years old. And to give you a sense of exactly what happened, apparently school had dismissed when a bullet hit the face of the 16-year-old. It was this white car coming from down there. It stopped right down there, and it was shooting in one direction at this boy. And I guess they shot him up here somewhere because, you know, blood and stuff was coming out his mouth. The victim was apparently one of many students in front of Orr High School when a car described by police as a white Chevy Z24 with fender damage and a license applied for sticker on a window drove past. At least one shot came from the car as it drove southbound on Pulaski past the school. Well, there's obviously a crowd of pe people out here because the school was dismissed. You know, so there was a bunch of people on the street. So whether that bullet was intended for him or somebody else, we cannot tell you at this point because we don't know. Like other Chicago schools, the police admit that Orr has its share of problems. Two police officers are assigned to the school. After the shooting, the officers assisted the victim and put out a description of the car. The injured student was then brought to Mount Sinai Hospital. Well, when he came in, he was talking, and his mental status seemed pretty clear. Uh, but he's lost a lot of blood. He had a gunshot wound that entered one cheek and exited the other. I've just been joined by Dr. Steve Bedrojan, who's the chief trauma surgeon here at Mount Sinai. Can you give me an idea? Has he uh, gone into surgery at all? Was that necessary? Uh, no, surgery is not necessary at this point. Uh, he's actually very fortunate that the, the bullet seems to have traversed the face without hitting any major arteries at this time. Uh, seems that he has multiple fractures of the sinuses inside the face, but uh, I think at this point conservative treatment is indicated and uh, we'll just try to uh, resuscitate him the best we can. He'll need to stay on a breathing machine for airway protection because of all the swelling in his neck, but uh, other than that he's very fortunate that uh, he doesn't have further damage at this point. I was told that right after he came in that uh, because of a combination of both blood loss and dropping blood pressure that he was uh, listed in critical condition. Yeah. The latest report I get is that now he is in serious condition. Uh, what's his prognosis? Um, it's kind of hard to tell, but I think his prognosis is good at this point. The, the, uh, the most important thing is that there's no uh, damage to his brain on CAT scan. Uh, and he's remained, his blood pressure has remained in the normal range ever since that initial, initial drop in pressure. Uh, so I think at this point his prognosis is very good. We had also heard that when he came in, he was conscious and speaking to doctors. Is he conscious now? Uh, no, he probably, he is conscious in the fact that he hears what, we, what we're talking about, but we've uh, sedated him to the point so we can keep the breathing tube in, so he, we don't let him wake up at this point. We're keeping him sedated. Thank you very much for taking a moment to talk with us. It looks like the news here at Mount Sinai Hospital, Stephen Allison, pretty good. Jim Ramsey reporting live. Back to you in the studio. All right, thank you, Jim. Police from Milwaukee and Lake County have identified a man found beaten to death on Thanksgiving Day, but that hasn't answered all the questions. The victim, who is linked to gangs in California, Milwaukee, and Chicago, was abducted 11 days ago. But the police search for his killer has run into a wall of gang silence, as Joni Lum reports. The two-state murder investigation started in Gurnee on this dirt road, where the body of 27-year-old Jose Luis Lechuga was found Thanksgiving Day. Police say Lechuga had been dumped on this muddy road after he was kidnapped at gunpoint outside a Milwaukee tavern. His eyes and mouth were covered with black electrical tape. The Lake County coroner ruled the victim died of blunt trauma to the head and had a puncture wound in the left arm. Because of the weather, she couldn't tell how long he'd been dead, but police do know the body had been in this area for less than 48 hours. Authorities say the motive for the murder is clear. His ultimate death. Uh, Homicide reflects back to him being involved in the illicit sale of drugs and his gang affiliation. They say several people in Milwaukee witnessed the kidnapping. That would definitely be to our advantage if we had a little bit of cooperation from uh, a lot of the individuals that are involved. 
but we have the fear of retaliation for any information that may be given to the police in regards to this. Police had hoped Lechuga's wife, who lives in Chicago, could help the investigation. She says Lechuga protected her by never talking about his business transactions. But she wants answers, too. She just wanted whoever done it, you know, the way they brutally killed him, beating him all to death, that as long as she just wanted him to be put away for a very long time. Now the 20-year-old woman is left to raise her 15-month-old son alone, and she is three months pregnant. Joni Lum, WGN News. And the Lake County coroner has ordered toxicology tests on Lechuga's body to determine whether he was given an injection through the puncture wound on his arm. Steve? Allison, a 16-year-old Southside boy is charged as an adult tonight in the rape of a two-year-old relative. Police say Benny White assaulted a little girl at his home last night while babysitting the child and her three-year-old brother. Investigators say when the parents returned home, the boy told them what happened. Authorities are now trying to determine whether the boy was molested as well. Meanwhile, a scary incident this morning in Morton Grove. An 18-year-old gas station attendant was robbed and kidnapped. This Amoco gas station is where the incident occurred. Two gunmen wearing ski masks walked up to the clerk and demanded that he open the door. When he did, he was handcuffed, while well, the men stole money out of the cash register. The robbers then ordered the clerk into their car, and the gunman then drove around for several hours before dumping him at the corners of Cumberland and Bryn Mawr. The clerk was unharmed, and the gunmen are still at large. Mayor Daley blames the gangs, the superintendent of police blames drugs, and still other community leaders say the crime that cripples some parts of Chicago is rooted in joblessness. All of that was discussed today at a three-day anti-crime summit that opened today. Carol davis Dillard reports. Politicians, business leaders, and community activists gathering to discuss crime, a problem they say is rooted in drugs. It has invaded and disrupted our schools. It drains and dearly catches our resources. Most importantly, it strangles, maims, and forever corrupts our young, our future. It is an issue city leaders say goes well beyond city limits. It's a national security question dealing with sale of drugs. We should use the armed forces. At the same time, interdiction and treatment should be equal in funding. And it is a problem this group sporting buttons and t-shirts with peace messages and a scrapbook showing page after page of weapons confiscated by police says will only be one if everyone pitches in. Officials here at the meeting stress the African proverb, it takes a whole village to raise a single child. They acknowledge the enormity of the task of licking the city's crime problem and say it is a problem that cannot be conquered without the involvement of everyone, particularly the parents. We need to point the fingers at ourselves because they are our children. And you cannot expect the police or any other official to go out and raise your children. They say part of the solution rests with the elimination of gang activity. And when Mayor Daley declared that a gang truce exists mainly because of police pressure, one participant took offense, later explaining why the mayor's position so upset him. Just the word peace is all we're asking him to support. Not individuals with bad backgrounds or, or doing negative things, but support the issue of peace. Other leaders add, though peace may begin with this anti-crime initiative, it'll take a lot more to keep streets safe. If, we, if they stop uh, the drugs, what is the, which is an industry, what are they going to do next if we don't have job training and create new jobs? Crime won't stop in this room, but officials say this conference is a historic beginning for what they hope will be a return to peace and quiet on the streets of Chicago. Carol Davis Diller, WGN News. The Anti-Crime Summit also includes workshops on issues such as job training, criminal justice, and community building. Chicago homeowners tonight are bracing for higher property taxes. It's part of a $3.3 billion city budget approved by a council committee, which calls for new or higher taxes on soda pop, off-track betting, and other entertainment. Ed Smith, Gavinsky. It's a $28.7 million property tax increase that, according to one estimate, would boost the tax bill on a $100,000 home by about $20 a year. Well, there has to be a base uh, in the property tax. We can't continue to expect that we're going to find nickel and dime solutions. But the budget does contain what might be considered nickel and dime taxes, in addition to that property tax increase. The proposal levels a penny per can tax on soda pop, a 
$1 admission fee for off-track betting parlors and an increase in the city amusement tax from 4 to 6%. In addition, the proposal eliminates 209 sworn jobs in the police department. But the increase in the property taxes is the most politically sensitive. I have basically all homeowners now under the new remap, and you just can't support another tax increase, a homeowner's tax increase, and people are just tired. Ever mindful that property taxes may be the most hated of all, administration critics are predicting a tough sell. I think they believe that the people of Chicago are so asleep and so cowed that they won't realize that this budget raises their property taxes and decreases their police protection. Now, some say the Daly administration may have chosen to take the heat for higher property taxes now rather than face the issue in the next mayoral election. A stubborn extra alarm fire has just been struck out tonight at a commercial building in the 3000 block of West Franklin. The building used to house a paint factory, the S&B Finishing Company. A hazardous materials team is on the scene, and ComEd has turned off the power in a three-block area just as a precaution. Fire officials say they don't know what started the fire, but it began in the paint baking area and no one was hurt. Still to come on the 9 o'clock news, report cards are out for Chicago, Illinois schools. And they got mostly a failing.